the vast majority of other workers, they want more job opportunities. They want to be able to, to make an income, to look for jobs, to switch careers, to have growth opportunities. Um, and that's essentially what it means to, to be pro-worker, I think. I think it means to have an abundance of job opportunities. Hello. Welcome again to the episode on the Let People Prosper show. My name is Dr. Vance Gim. I hope you're having a prosperous day. Well, today I'm delighted to bring on another guest who knows a lot about the labor market, about free markets, and just an overall good person who loves to work on these policy issues. And it's other than Dr. Leah Palagashvili. Leah, welcome to the Let People Prosper show. Thanks so much for having me on here. Good, 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 good. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to have you on. And before we get into um, all of the good discussion today, let me go ahead and give the audience your, your bio, and then we'll jump right into it. So um, Leah is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Her primary research interests include entrepreneurship, regulation, and the gig economy. She has published academic articles, book chapters, policy papers, and articles in media outlets such as the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. In 2016, she was named one of the Forbes 30 under 30 in law and policy. Um, she was an assistant professor of economics at State University of New York um, Purchase and earned her PhD in economics from George Mason University. It's always good to have some GMU folks on, had a few on already. Um, so Leah, with all that said, um, let me start off with the question I ask every guest. Why do you do what you do every day? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, look, I've, I've lived in another part of the world and it's not pretty. <laughs> so I was, I was born in the yeah, <laughs> I was born in the Soviet Union, yeah. and while I was too young to experience it as an adult, I heard nothing but Soviet Union stories growing up. Um, and I, I moved to the United States when I was seven, and we lived in Armenia before that, which used to be part of the Soviet Union, and today it's still a developing country um, where most people there are still in poverty and have very few opportunities. And I. I think that's something I didn't realize as a child, but over the course of growing up in America and from all the opportunities I had open up to me while I was there, it it really was the most pivotal moment in my life. And it's just that that's what has been driving me to like thinking about those just vast amount of opportunities I had just by being in the United States by pure luck, by the way, because we had won, you know, a green card lottery. Mm. And I think the fact that we were living in the U.S. and not in Armenia set up my career and where I am today more than anything else that has happened in my life. And so that's kind of a, the truth that I've that I've had and I've experienced in my life. It's both inspiring and it's heartbreaking in some sense that the institutions of a country can have such significant role in cultivating or hindering you as a person or your ability to reach for your own stars and to climb your own mountains or pursue your own dreams. But that's the truth. And it's strengthened every day when I talk or see family members who are still currently living in post-Soviet countries today, like cousins who are still my age, all with so much potential, but it goes just completely unrealized because of the country that just, they just happened to be born with or the, or the war that they were forced to go into and, and so forth. And I think at the end of the day, that that's kind of what motivates me. Um, just, just seeing how much your life, you know, how much your life is set up depending on the institutions of the country that, that you're in. And that's what inspired me to get into economics in the first place. Cause I was just a, you know, a high school student and randomly took an econ class and taking that econ class helped me understand why, you know, one country like Armenia has such fast differences in opportunities and economic situation and, and all these various things compared to the U S and that has been my, my lens going in and why, you know, I, I do what I do today, focusing specifically by the way on labor policy today. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love it. There's so much to go into there and kind of unpack, but I, I, I wonder, you know, with Soviet Union, Armenia and everything else in your background and knowing the institutional changes. And I talk a lot about that too, Leah, um, with Douglas North mm -hmm. and institutional economics. Um, that's some of my favorite stuff. And Peter Betke, he's always talking about that as well. Um, you know, w when you when you look at your past and where you came from and coming to the U.S. and your family and everything else, what are what are some of the 
if it, institutional changes <laughs> that really helped you get to where you're at today and then form your thoughts about economics and where we should head as a country here in America? Yeah, so that, that, that's a great question. And there's a lot. And I'll start with just one you know, story because it, it relates to what I'm working right now yeah. on uh, pro, pro-worker policies or pro-labor policies. And it's kind of a weirdly controversial word because um, in some sense, like if you think about the Soviet Union, that's often associated with this like worker power paradise, mm. right? Everyone has a job and it's a decent job and so forth. But in the Soviet Union, all aspects of work were super regulated, because it was under this principle that every Soviet citizen must have a good, meaningful job that pays decent wages. And so that meant a job was guaranteed by the government, right? Yeah. There were rigid pay standards for each profession. You, there was no like huge growth opportunity. You couldn't be like, oh, I'm making, you know, you know, $15 an hour today, but in a year I could be making $300 an hour, right? Yeah. There, was, there was none of that. There's no huge growth opportunities. It was all super regulated. Mm. Like you're in this profession, you make this much and that's all you make. And then maybe it'll change by $5 or whatever, yeah. <laughs> uh, however amount later. So it was very, very much regulated. And I think, um, you know, people don't realize that, but by the way, it's so regulated that um, it was you know, obviously it was impossible to get fired, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which inevitably meant there was less job mobility. So you're like, I'm stuck in this job forever. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, And then the other thing that I, that really has affected me um, in terms of my own research is that any pursuit of income that was self-employment was strictly prohibited Mm. in the Soviet Union. Okay. And this actually, this this prohibition is what sent my grandfather to jail for nearly a decade wow. in the Soviet Union because he tried to earn income by making and selling hats on the side, which was illegal, right? You can't do any self-employment job. When you go home at the end of the day, you go home. There's no work allowed. Hmm. <laughs> and that that's what I mean by it was like it's worker power, worker paradise. But in some ways, it's not yeah. because it's so regulated that you can't pursue what you want to pursue maybe. And maybe he wanted to make more income than was there regulated, you know, wage for that job and he couldn't. Hmm. And so he ended up taking a risk um, and it didn't go the way he wanted. <laughs> so he was actually in jail for nearly, you know, a decade. Wow. And to for me, selling this hats. is like, for selling just hats. A, yeah, for selling hats oh. on the side, which you're not allowed to do. Okay. Like self-employment is strictly prohibited. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so it's kind of crazy because, you know, three decades later and several, you know, thousand miles west, we're kind of a you know, witnessing America's own labor movement, Hmm. thinking about the same kind of worker power, you know, pro-worker agenda and what it means. And it's especially fascinating, you know, in these last few years, because we're seeing some conservatives, you know, now joining progressives in embracing this vital role of like, oh, pro-worker policies, um, which are often often contrasted with pro-business policies, because sometimes, the perception is that conservatives and Republicans are pro-business, so they're going to push pro-business policies, maybe like tax cuts, corporate tax rates, th- things like that, yeah, right? Yeah. Whereas um, progressives or the old left are usually seen as pro-worker, but now we're seeing conservatives with the you know new new right, so to speak, jumping on on this bandwagon of being pro-worker. But it's the same. But to me, it's like yeah, you can be pro-worker, but how are you contrasting this pro-worker agenda from the old left? And it's basically the same, Mm -hmm. right? It's Mm -hmm. all about like all worker power. It's the same rhetoric and similar concepts about um, um, decent wages, good jobs. Uh, So if you take something like the American Compass, for example, they published a piece that was like, oh, most American jobs are not good jobs. And it's like, well, okay, how do you fact, what goes into that, right? And then you open up their methodology and it's like oh like they have to pay this much and they have to provide this many benefits and they have to be in these sectors that are valuable and it's the exact same concept yep. right yep. and it goes back to that Soviet union concept like these are not good jobs and we're going to choose what are good jobs and you have to follow these jobs and there's going to be pay standards and regulations and here you go you're in worker power paradise and and that's kind of what I'm working on right now because I think this pro worker concept is totally backwards mm. people have it backwards Pro-worker policy should not just be about job security and having super stable, uh, you know, pay standards and jobs. That's one aspect of it, right? Yeah. But but more importantly, pro-worker policy should be about 
should be about job opportunities mm. and expanding job opportunities and expanding diverse set of job opportunities to meet diverse set of needs for people. And let me just give it Italy as an example, by the yeah. way. It's a country I'm, you know, quite familiar with because my husband is from Italy. Okay. He's, you know, he grew up there. I went to school there. All of his family is from there. And it's a country known for, you know, beautiful landscapes, amazing food, art. Um, but it's not a country known for a thriving labor market. Mm. And you might be tricked to believe that, oh, it's a pro-worker paradise because in Italy, by the way, you know, there's like sense of job security. It's virtually impossible to get fired. Um, those who do have workers make decent wages, right? But like in the Soviet Union, there's not a lot of opportunity for growth. Mm. It's kind of on a strict pay schedule and so forth. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and they're, and, and basically, like I mentioned before, just current regulations make it almost impossible for businesses to fire people. Mm. And so my husband and almost all of his well-educated cohort who, you know, had graduated from Bocconi University, one of the you know highest ranked economics program in Italy, they were all forced to seek employment ab abroad upon mm. graduation because there were no jobs in Italy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because, because having being so job pro job security means there's a trade off mm. and that's reduction in job opportunity and job mobility. And who suffers are young people, right? Who mm -hmm. don't have a lot of job experience or maybe other people who are otherwise undesired might might be seen as undesirable like oh you have um I don't know, maybe maybe even people with disabilities, right? Anything anything where like someone's like, "Oh, well, I'm taking a risk by hiring you and I'm going to be stuck with you forever. We're married. It's going to be impossible to, you know, to uh, to fire you if you're not doing well. You're stuck with them forever. The companies are going to be more reluctant to hire them. And that's exactly what happened in Italy. Like I said, you've got this super well-educated cohort that had to all go abroad to find jobs. Um, and and you, Italy, as a youth unemployment rate was actually... 45% almost 10 years ago. And now it's at 25%, but it's still the highest. And it's, you know, compared to its developed world counterparts in Europe. Yeah. Um, and wow. I think that, you know, and, and that that's the thing, right? Like you don't go to Italy to pursue the Italian dream mm -hmm. like you would the American dream, except, yeah. you know, if you the Italian dream is like you travel, right? So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you work somewhere else, you make money somewhere else, but then you go to Italy to travel. That's like a different Italian dream. Yeah. But I mean, you, you wouldn't go to, to Italy to be like, I'm seeking to get work and to grow and to have access to opportunities. Like you wouldn't go there. And it's not a coincidence, right? It's that's mm -hmm. not a coincidence. It's that these labor policies, which might look good on the one hand because they provide job security and decent wages and these super regulated pay standards, just like the Soviet Union, right? But they come at an at a cost, right? With less job mobility, less fewer job opportunities, and um, again, employers being reluctant to hire workers, especially in experienced youth or older workers, um, or where you know where it's unclear, you know, how the worker will perform on the mm. job. And again, like less labor market mobility or turnover means that you're not going to go to Italy to look for a job, mm -mm. right? That's not the place, you know, you're you're better off, you know, finding like beautiful cafes there yeah. <laughs> and looking at art, but not for jobs. And so I think that's kind of what we have backwards yeah. right now. And in, in thinking about what does pro worker mean? People are like pro worker means job security. No, not necessarily. For some people, they might value that and and they want to seek jobs out in the U.S. that provide that. But for 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 the vast majority of other workers, they want more job opportunities. Mm. They want to be able to to make an income, to look for jobs, to switch careers, to have growth opportunities, um, and that's essentially what it means to to be pro worker. I think I think it means to have an abundance of job opportunities, and that's what we have in the U.S. currently. I mean, it's being kind of threatened right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think that's, you know, that's a little bit, that's a backwards way of thinking about pro worker has to be job security. That's not it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, great points. I, I was just, um, and I want to mention for the audience, you have a great Substack newsletter, Labor Market Matters. Um, and, so, and I'll put some of this in the show notes page. Um, but there's one here is what is a quote unquote good job? And I think you explained a lot of that really well there. Uh, but I wanted to give you an opportunity maybe to expand on that if you wanted to, because you're right. We're hearing a lot about this from the, the left and the right, um, from the, the new right or the national conservatives, um, where they talk about 
being um, almost pro-union again, that we need to get unions involved in everything. And then there's this idea of a, a job for life, like you, you mentioned. And, and, and some even harken back to say, you know, why are, why are women having to be in the workforce almost, where we need mainly men and having uh, a single family income um, or single person income for the household? And I, I, it seems to me like this is trying to move us backwards and not forward in a situation where we have more entrepreneurship, we have independent contractors. We have people that want to start their own businesses. I, I'm one of them. Um, and and yeah. so a lot of this seems backwards, Leah. And, and so I wonder, you know, what constitutes a good job? <laughs> yeah, that's the fundamental question. Yeah. And yeah, it, it is. It's getting brought up so much. I even saw like Department of Labor tweeting to like, we need more good jobs. What is a good job? Good jobs are unionized jobs <laughs> with decent wages yeah. and stable income. And yeah, it, it, again, it gets back to this concept where, like, there's some person out there, some individual who's being like, here's what a good job is. Yeah. And, like, all jobs have to look that way. And that's fundamentally wrong thinking. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, what I said in that Substack post is calls for having a good job are a lot like calls for building good homes. And you might be like, well, what's a good home? Yeah. <laughs> and so when I was, like, a young 22-year-old, right, a good home was, like, a studio apartment in the center of New York City. It was super run down, but it was close to everything, and I was in the center of the universe. And, by the way, like, there was no sink in the bathroom, yeah. right? <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> that, was a good, that was a good home right. at that time. Yeah. Yeah, I would never choose, like, a huge house no. with five bedrooms and the farm when I was, you know, at that point in my life when I was 22 and I'm like in, you know, I want to live in New York City in the center of the universe. I'm in grad school. I'm trying to build up my career. Like I'm not going to, you know, have a farmhouse. Yeah, yeah no. <laughs> but I might want that now, by the way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> With two kids, right? And so forth. Yes. But that's, that's what I mean is like there's there's not this like preconceived notion of like here's what a good job is. Yeah. Just like there's not really this preconceived notion of like, you know, here are, here are what's a good, here's what a good home is. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of, you know, what's driving, you know, what, so how do we know what is a good job? I think a lot of it depends on, on the individual level, what that person finds to be a good job in that point in, in his life. So if you take someone who is a, in a high school student, um, who's looking for a part-time job, they can do like one or two hours after school just to make some income, a minimum wage job, you know, at a, maybe a small business yeah. or at like a McDonald's or something in your town close by who allows you to work two or three hours a week. Um, that's not a bad job. No. That's actually a good job yep. <laughs> for that person. And so to be like, oh, you know, you're making $8 an hour. That's terrible. You can't make a living on that where you're like, well, what's the context? If it's like a, a high school student who just wants it as a part-time job, which, you know, I was there, yeah, you know, lots same. of other, I don't know if you were there yeah, too, Vance, there. right? Yeah, you were there. Yes. Exactly. Like, those are great opportunities for us. Right. Like, that was super valuable. If you try to regulate that out of existence and be like, no, no, all the McDonald's jobs should pay $20 an hour because that's what it means to make a basic living. Well, then those jobs aren't going to the teenagers because mm. who work, who, is, who are going to work three or four hours after school each day, like they're going to go to uh, someone who's more experienced, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And who's like, oh, no, I'll dedicate 40 hours to this McDonald's job. And people just don't understand that, I think, because... Again, like the reason that um, that McDonald's job exists, right, and the reason that it's not paying twenty twenty dollars an hour is is the why me, the teenager with no job skills at all, and who's off willing to work after school for three four hours, is able to get that job. Yes, yeah. Um, and so, and and by the way, same thing if we talk about someone who's like again, like let's say a twenty two year old me. And in New York City, right? Yeah. A good job might be like a bootstrap startup that yeah. is super exciting and challenging with high growth potential, but it pays me mostly in equity. So mm. I get like zero salary and I work 80 hours a week with few benefits and it offers me absolutely no job security. Yeah, yeah. No job security. But at that point in my life as a 22 year old, right? That might be a good job. Yeah. Now that sounds like a terrible job for someone who is maybe in their 40s, who has four kids, and they can't take on that risk of working at a bootstrap startup with no income, right? And just equity for the future. Yeah. And so again, that's why it's 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 incorrect to say that there are these preconceived notions of what it means to have a to be a good job. Because if you put up that list of like, here's what it means to have a good job the startup would not fit into that list. Yeah, no. <laughs> but that might be a great job for someone who's looking for something like that, who's looking for something where they don't pay you as much in salary because they can't, but that has 
that has really high uh, job potential. Yep. Um, anyway, so that was yeah. kind of the way to think about it is because, you know, there are trade-offs and you can't just, you know, have it all no. <laughs> in some sense. And, and that's why, you know, that's why these preconceived notions of like, oh, this is exactly what we need to have a good job don't make sense because depending on, you know, a good job depends on who's looking for that job and what they want. Yep. Yep. Well put. Um, and I think from your actually last line here in this, in this post, which I'll put in the show notes page, but it says rather than aiming to make existing jobs meet some arbitrary de- definition of quote, a, a good job in quote, um, pro worker advocates should focus on policies that can create a thriving labor market with an abundance and diversity of job opportunities to meet workers diverse wants and needs. And I think that's, that's huge, right? Because what you're getting at is there's not one size fits all job. Mm-hmm. Is that everyone has diverse needs and wants and preferences along the way in economics terms? We like to use preferences, yeah. and 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 it goes from both sides of the labor market, right? Because you ha- also have the employer who doesn't necessarily need the same worker for every single job. Just like on the worker side, you don't want the same job along the way, and it depends on what what part of your career you're in, whether it's yeah. no kids at 22 or three kids at 42, like I am now, <laughs> there, 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 there are different ways to go about it. Cause yeah. Cause when I was 16, um, I, you know, I got a part-time job. I was working at Pilgrim cleaners. I was tagging clothes and doing the cashier. I was learning, you know, how to, how to talk to people and things of that nature. And I just worked a few hours. I was in homeschool then. Um, and so I got to work about six hours a day and then do my school on the side. Um, but that's what I needed at that time. And I, but I learned so much. And what I'm, what I'm concerned about, Leah, is that we're putting in all these quote unquote pro worker or good job sort of mandates and higher minimum wages we're reducing their opportunities to get their foot in the door of the economic ladder for their career later on. And, and, and this is, I think, contributing to this issue where some people say Gen Zers are lazy or Gen Zers aren't wanting to work, which I don't know, there's evidence that that's not necessarily true, but there are some who don't want to go to work. But I think a lot of it also is that a lot of these um, lower skilled jobs just aren't available as much to them anymore. And, and AI might start to um, take over mm-hmm. some of those jobs as well. But, but are you seeing some of that in the, in the statistics and the data in, in your research? Yeah, so I, I just want to point out to one thing you oh. mentioned, which is like higher minimum wage jobs, oh. right? So uh, that's another point, right? Where people are like, oh, we're pushing higher minimum wage jobs to have these good jobs. But they don't understand the trade-offs yeah. that come with that as well. And so one one thing that is actually k- kind of odd to me because it comes from um, a lot of it is coming from national conservatives or con- you know new right yep. who are pushing these um, pushing these ideas like we need to make ensure that all good jobs are high wages right but a lot of conservatives have small business they they're also supposed to be the pro small business right mm, yep. <laughs> party as well. But that those that's a trade off, right? Because small businesses, you know, one they make up a back they make up the backbone of American society. Um, and then, by the way, creating a small business is often the source of income for many underprivileged and minority workers. Mm-hmm. And of course, there are some small businesses that you know do make a lot of money. M- many of them are just your typical kind of main street establishment entrepreneurs, and they are in like. What let's say an average salary of thirty thousand a year, so that's far below you know the national average mean wage, right? Yeah. Um, and so when organizations like American Compass, for example, push for these, like, oh, we we have to make sure all of the all all jobs are high paying jobs, to me, it's really a call for like, oh, you're trying to transfer um, some income from low like low income small business owners to low income wage earners. Mm. That's another way to see it, right? So it's not just like it's not this like, oh, okay, minimum wage, therefore workers are earning more. It's like, it's a transfer from low income small business earners to low income wage earners. Mm. So being like wage earners being those on, on, on payroll. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you can't, you can't kind of have both, you can't have both things, right? You can't be like, I want to support small businesses, but also I want to make sure that all good jobs are paying super high because that might not cut it for those small business owners who are not making a lot of money. No. And so, and by the way, sometimes you get these arguments that are like, oh, well, if small businesses can sustain decent wages for workers and they shouldn't exist at all. Like I've, I've heard that before. Yeah. I think I heard it in like a Freakonomics podcast too with one of the speakers. 
Um, but then that again illustrates a trade off in the pro worker policy proposal because small business owner is a worker yep. who employs you know many other workers and like those other workers aims to make a living and sustain their family. So when you say things like the small business shouldn't exist if they can't pay decent wages, you're again kind of saying like, well, I don't care about that. <laughs> that worker, yes. <laughs> the small business owner, I care about the employee or the wage worker. But again, it's a trade off. So you can't have both, no. right? You can't say like, I'm pro worker, increase the minimum wage. Okay, but well, what about this, you know, worker who's a small business owner who has one employee and, you know, increasing the minimum wage too much would make them close down their business because they, they can't make a living. Yeah. On that. It's and, like, and, and Leah, real quick, it's like picking winners and losers. These are the winners yeah. and these are the losers, right? Yeah, the small business owners, yeah are the losers yep, yep. And, and, and then the winners are going to be the wage earners. And so, and so what happens as a result is that you're going to have, um, it depends how much we push this, like these sort of proposals, like higher minimum wage and others that, that force small businesses to try to basically compete with medium size and larger companies mm -hmm. on these, which they can't. And there's evidence of this in, in economics, just a lot of it, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of evidence that shows that, by the way, that's the reason why sometimes when new regulations are passed, they specifically say exemption for small businesses under 50 employees. Um, because everybody knows that like a lot of times those, those small businesses that have 50, less than 15 employees. They don't have a lot of resources. They don't make a lot of profits, right? They're, you can't treat them the same as Walmart and be like, okay, everybody has to pay $20 an hour for any worker. That's going to crash. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to crash a lot of small businesses. And then what do those small business owners do? Well, like they're going to have to close down their business. So that's fewer job opportunities for others who might have worked there. And then they're going to have to, like everyone else, look for, um, you know, wage opportunities, like which they're going to be shrinking. Yeah. And so it creates this this problem where, um, yeah, it just creates this problem where there's going to be fewer job opportunities. And it goes against what I was just saying, yeah. where pro worker means expansion of job opportunities and, and and expanding a diverse set of job opportunities. Because, again, you know, you you have this rhetoric that like, oh, only unionized jobs are good jobs. And I, you know, some people might prefer that. Sure. Like, I'm not against that, right? Right. Some people might say like, I want a unionized private sector or, or you know, public sector job or private sector job that has good and steady work hours, wage benefits. I want, you know, I want to be on a schedule, and that makes sense for some people in some in some point of their lives, or um, it's a preference, right, for others. Mm -hmm. But maybe others don't want that, right? Maybe they want like a high paying job at a large uh, corporation with the best benefits America has to offer. They don't, you know, or maybe they want like a small business job yeah. that's super relaxed yeah. <laughs> and that doesn't offer as many benefits, but they get, they get um, other benefits out of it because it's super relaxed. It's flexible. They get to be local. There's a lot of engagement with community, family, and friends. Um, or maybe you want to go work at a nonprofit like I do that, you know, inspires you every day, or maybe you want to be a freelancer or an independent contractor mm. or advance some of what you're doing, yeah, right? Right, right. <laughs> this is my own business. Yeah. And, and that like, that means, un, you know, an unstable income. So it's like almost the opposite of a unionized job, right? Um, but you get other benefits out of it, which is like, well, I, I have this huge opportunity to grow that I wouldn't because I'm on like a pay scale at a unionized job, right? Yes. <laughs> With that has all these things. And then you get kind of maximum job, um, work flexibility. Flexibility. Say, like yeah. Flexibility. Yeah. You get, you get to schedule, you know, maybe these podcasts yeah. when you want. That's right. Spend well, time with my kids you. more. Exactly. Like you want, know, you want to hit a balance. Maybe you don't want to work 40 hours no. a week, but you want to work 20 hours a week. Yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. And you're willing to accept the trade off that comes mm. with it. And I think, and, and by the way, there's this war on kind of freelancers and independent contractors going on right now. I, I, I guess I, war is too strong of a word. It's not really a war. It's just the sense that like, oh, freelancing and independent contracting aren't good jobs. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm like, but like, yeah, there aren't good jobs for some people who don't want them, but for others, they actually, that's what they seek out and that's what they want to do. Yeah. And we have research and data on that, that, you know, even from the BLS, right? Like 80% of all independent contractors want that job up. I don't, you know, they want to be in those non-traditional work arrangements and only one in 10 would prefer to have an employment arrangement. Again, they're choosing that job for a reason. Yeah. And you might, maybe, you know, someone might come back and say like, oh no, it's not a choice because they couldn't find, you know, an employment opportunity. And that's fair. Yeah. That might be for the a minority of those workers, which is what the survey evidence shows, somewhere between like 10 to 20% of workers who are independent contractors 
want a full-time employment job, mm. but they can't find it. But by the way, looking at um, the United States as a whole, in 2023, 90% of all jobs in the U.S. were employment jobs, mm. and only 10% were kind of independent contracting, like non-traditional work arrangements sort of thing. And so, again, if mm. you want to really find an, an employment job, the question is like, okay, why can't that person find it? Like, what's going on? What's going on there? How can we help that person? We don't try to destroy freelancing or independent contracting or try to turn those jobs into employment jobs because we want to try to understand why can't 10 to 20 percent kind of get what you know those sort set of jobs that they want but that you know we don't want to reduce you know freelancing and independent contracting for the vast majority of workers who benefit from that and who want those set of jobs yeah 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 no that's that's great and i think i was looking over um, some of your other posts here recently, I mean, you've done a lot of work in this space where, you know, there's a um, congressional testimony you had on flexible benefits for a flexible workforce, which has a lot of key points in here. Um, and I like how you number them out. So for the audience, go and check these out. You get a good overview. Um, and then there was another one. So that was U.S. House. Uh, and then you also had one at Massachusetts, in Massachusetts, Special Joint Committee on Initiative Petitions for App-Based Drivers, Transportation, Network Carriers. Um, and those are just in the last few months about you know, their, um, the gig economy and Uber and Lyft and a lot of this stuff that's going on, which also happens to be, in some cases, um, second jobs that they're trying to get additional yeah. income to meet their household needs. And when we start having a more top-down approach of government regulation, government coming in to re remove these opportunities, we don't have the same abundance that people can then meet their, their unique needs with their family and everyone else. And, and um, this, is a, this is a huge issue. I, I wonder, what, what are some good steps for legislators to think about this? I have a lot of state and congressional members who listen to the podcast um, and influencers across the country. Um, where do you usually like to start with, with policy in this area? I mean, when I think about some of these things, I'm usually like, well, first, let's get government out of the way <laughs> and, and try to pull some things back so people can have more abundance. Um, but maybe there might be some other steps that people can take that can really start heading things in the right direction. Yeah, so I think the, the first step is don't eliminate these jobs, right? Yeah. That's, that's the starter. Because that's a good one. Um, yeah, like because again, <laughs> pro worker, pro pro worker means abundance of work opportunities, yeah. right? And so some of those work opportunities are W two employment jobs. Some of those other work opportunities might be supplemental side income um, that you're seeking out. And by the way, unlike like unlike full time kind of freelancers who are in the creative field, usually like. I don't know, musicians and actors, mm. those in the gig app based gig economy platform, for the most part, like over 80, 90 percent and all data that we look at, like tax records, social security data and everything. They're supplemental earners. Mm. They tend to be supplemental earners who have full time W-2 jobs. And so um, what that means is you've got some person who has a nine to five PM job, <clears throat> wants to make more income. They turn on their Uber app or their Lyft app or their DoorDash app. Right. Yeah. And they try to make maybe they work one or two hours a day you know, after their full-time job, or maybe they work on the weekends, or maybe they, you know, work two or three times a month, and then they don't work the next month, and then they might turn it on the, the following month and so forth. But those, that kind of, again, illustrates like, um, America's great. Like we have these supplemental job opportunities for people. And if you go back to the story I told you in the beginning with my grandfather and the Soviet Union, like that wasn't allowed. Yeah. <laughs> that was prohibited. Like you literally can't be like, let me like, you know, and by the way, my dad was a taxi driver mm. and the in the Soviet Union. And he also, by the way, he was the entrepreneurial spirit runs in my family because he would also work off hours illegally. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> but he didn't get caught. Good, good. <laughs> but, but that's the point, right? Like it was, you know, 5 p.m. ended, but he's like, I would like an opportunity to make more money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like, you're not allowed to. Uh. But just real quickly, that, uh, right? it, like, it, why are you not allowed to make more money? Like yeah. you should be able to make more money if you want to. It's yes. your it's your life. <laughs> and it's, it kind of breeds this underground economy, though, too. Whenever you prohibit oh, something, yeah. people find ways to do it. Unfortunately, I guess some of them get caught and get locked up. But but it's unfortunate that situation even exists. It's terrible. Exactly. It really, it really is unfortunate. But that's what I'm saying. When you come to the U.S., and, and that's, again, institutions matter. Right? Yeah. When you come yes. to the U.S., my parents were working... 9 to 5 p.m. employment jobs, but to make more income, they took on side jobs, side hustles, independent contracting, and that allowed them to meet their needs and that allowed them to grow, yeah. right? And if they wouldn't have been able to do that, they would have been substantially worse off. And so the presence of supplemental jobs 
it doesn't make Americans like worse off. It makes us it makes us better off. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. It's I mean, you can have a broader question. like, you know, if, if we had a problem of only like gig economy jobs. Right. Or if you had a problem where like 80 percent of jobs are only gig economy jobs or only independent contracting, then you might have a point and be like, OK, we, you know, we don't have a lot of these full time W2 jobs, but that's 10 percent you know, of, of our industry of, of work, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 90% is full time W2 employment. And so, you know, for starters, it, it's not helpful to eliminate side jobs or side hustles for people. Um, and again, the app based gig economy world is where we see most of, you know, independent contractors being side hustles for, for other people, like freelancing is a full time thing, right? Yeah. That's their job. Yeah, it's not like, oh, I'm doing this on the side. Um, but in the app based world, that's where we see that. And so, what I've, um, you know, what I've talked about before is what can we do to enhance the lives of independent contractors? So, like, we don't want to eliminate their jobs, right? Mm -hmm. And by the way, when we do try to eliminate their jobs, it backfires, like what happened in California, AB5. You know, we actually did a whole, you know, empirical study on this, what we saw out of California, AB5. Uh, using BLS data and Census Bureau uh, data that my team did is that we saw it led to a reduction in self-employment jobs hmm. that wasn't accompanied by an increase in payroll jobs for effective in affected industries. So it made workers overall worse off. Yeah, um, I, I know we saw that in news articles like you know New York Times of all places, but Los Angeles Times all highlighted the people who lost their jobs as a result of AB5. Hmm. But that's what I mean. Like those sort of policies don't actually help workers. So let's step a take a step back. How do we help those yeah. who are self-employed, independent contractors, whether they're doing it as supplemental income or as like full-time income? And we go back to like, let's look at the survey evidence. Okay. So the survey evidence says that most independent contractors want their non-traditional work arrangements um, because they either require it or desire it. Again, there's this flexibility point. There are moms who can't take on full-time jobs, um, other mm -hmm. reasons. Um, but at the same time, they say across every survey that I've seen, like, oh, it would be, it would be great to have access to flexible or portable benefits. Okay, what does that mean? Those are just benefits that stay with the worker and travel with the worker, and they're not attached to a particular company. So it's not like, oh, you get your health insurance only from your company. So if you leave your company, okay, you lose your health insurance. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, that's backwards. And the economics literature, you know, economists have highlighted how this is actually that's not great for labor markets. Mm -hmm. You know, MIT economist John Gr Jonathan Gruber has so many studies on exactly this point that like um, the tying in, you know, health insurance to your job actually reduces uh, job mobility and it is actually worse for, for labor markets in general. But anyway, that's yeah. kind of the, the bigger picture thing. The smaller thing that we can do for our independent contractors is what I call legalizing access to benefits for independent contractors. So right now, mm -hmm. you know, in across federal agencies and within states, yeah. um, regulations prohibit independent contractor or prohibit hiring parties like companies, organizations who work with independent contractors from providing benefits to those independent contractors. Mm. And you're like, wait, why is that the case? Well, if they provide benefits to independent contractors, the IRS sees that and they say like, oh no, Vance, you're an independent contractor. You got benefits from this organization. It looks like you're an employee. Let me reclassify you as an employee. Mm. And that's a huge cost. Yep, yep. Uh, and it risks business models in some cases, right? And it also means that in cases where you, the worker, don't want to be an employee, now you're slapped with like, now you're an employee with this, or with this organization. And it's also misclassification, fines, and all these other risks associated. And so as mm. a result, companies can't freely give benefits to independent contractors. Um, they get punished for doing that. Yeah. And not many people know about this, but, you know, it's nothing new. It's, you know, go on the IRS website. They say this directly <laughs> and they're not the only agency states do this as well. And so I've been talking about reforms um, of legalizing access to flexible to portable or flexible benefits to independent contractors by removing these barriers. Mm. And states are actually now experimenting with this. Uh, you know, Utah last year, you know, some members read my policy brief and they were inspired to pass a bill that removed this, you know, presence of benefits as a factor in determining whether a worker is an independent contractor or employee. Um, and, you know, in Utah, by the way, last month, um, uh, Target's shift started uh, pro started a, a pilot program where they're going to start providing benefits to independent contractors as a result of, of this bill. Hmm. Uh, we also saw in Pennsylvania, 
Uh, DoorDash is, you know, launched a first of its kind, like pilot portal benefits program. Again, he had to, DoorDash had to get the approval of the governor of Pennsylvania to do so, uh, because you get into these, you know, the legal issue that I just, I just mentioned. Yeah. But that's, again, that's one way, like it's a tiny step, right? It's not going to mean, it's not the end, you know, end yeah. all be all, whatever it is, right? It's not going to lead to, you know, all independent contractors getting benefits, but we can at least take small steps. And that's one you know, small marginal step towards a better world yeah. where we can allow just legalize independent contractors being able to get benefits. Yeah. Like, let's start there and then see what happens. And that improves the position of the independent contractor without reducing the job opportunities yeah. for for workers. Um, and, and that's a small thing that I've been talking about. I have other ideas on, sure. my, on my sub stack for other ways that we can you know, enable access to portable benefits. I, some, my, you know, my colleague who you uh, interviewed as well, Veronique, talks yes. about universal, um, you know, universal savings accounts, right? USAs, mm -hmm. which are kind of like Roth IRAs, but without the restrictions on, um, you know, taking it out and the penalties for retirement. So it's not supposed to be like a retirement savings account. It's supposed to be just a savings account. Yeah. And those are super valuable for independent contractors um, who have often in stable income streams. And so being able to access a savings account that's tax advantaged without penalties would be, you know, a huge improvement in their lives as yeah. well. So there are lots of different types of these proposals that would enhance portable benefits for independent contractors. But that's really the that's the future. It allows those workers to step into the future rather than trying to reduce their work opportunities as independent contractors and self-employed individuals. Yeah, yeah. No, those are excellent. Um, and I'll be sure, again, to put those in the show notes. And I, I think as we're wrapping up here, which has been a great conversation, thank you for, for doing this today. Um, what do you think about the future when it comes to AI and the potential for the substitution effect that some have talked about, where workers are going to be replaced with AI and robots and other things like that. Um, what are your thoughts about that as being a substitute versus a complement? And maybe we're going to find ways to overcome that with more abundance and, and, and making sure that we have mm -hmm. these ideas of, 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 of allowing for them more freedom and compared to pr put in, imposing more government restrictions in the process. Yeah, I think this kind of doomsday, like robots are going to take over our jobs yeah. is unfounded Yes, <laughs> because people always there. And, and, and to be fair, it's, it's a natural reaction from, from humans yes. for, you know, even, even like, you know, as parents who like, there's something bad thing that they're like, it's going to be really bad for my child. You're not thinking about like, oh, okay, hold on. Let's step back for a second. But it's the same thing with AI. I think people are underestimating the potential of AI tools to be complements mm -hmm. for your work to enhance worker productivity, to, to make that worker, um, in some sense, like be able to get more income because it makes them productive. And I had my research assistant, um, who's now pursuing his PhD in economics mm. at Duke, right? He, like, ChatGPT came out and he instantly, like, increased his ability to be a better, you know, research assistant, to be yeah. a better economist. He used it to basically to learn coding on his own, wow. right? And to other skills. And he was like our, you know, we called him our, like, ChatGPT super user because across the whole organization, like anything, he would he would use it as an opportunity to be like, how do I enhance my skills with it? Yes. How do I make how do how can I use this to make me do my work faster and better and so forth? And so, by the way, what does that? There's an inherent trade off there too, right? My research assistant, former researcher Chris, being able to enhance his skills using AI means that he demanded he might have gone on Fiverr or Upwork and tried to hire a person to mm. do a coding task for him, right? And, and so, yes, that person loses a potential job in some sense, but Chris has just increased his own, yes. <laughs> his own, uh, work, you know, work abilities, yeah. right? And he made him more productive and more valuable to the organization and enhance his own skills with AI. And so you kind of get that, like, you know, yes, there's going to be some job substitution Yeah. Yeah. in this exact case that I illustrated with Chris, you, you see it right there. I gave him a task. And, you know, one of the ways in which we he could have handled that task, which we thought about was like, oh, maybe it's easier to just find someone on Fiverr to contract out this, you know, this thing that we had to do. Mm -hmm. 
Um, or the other way you use it is you use AI to enhance the skills and then he did it faster and better. And yeah. we didn't have to contract out that person lost a job opportunity, but we have an enhanced worker who made himself more valuable, increased his future income yeah. <laughs> and, and abilities and so forth. But that's like the other side of AI that, you know, we're not getting that story, but it's out there and it exists. And actually I'm in the process of starting a research study where we're going to look for job postings across all of the U S to see where they're starting to ask for these, um, AI skills, yeah. right? And that kind of gets at this question of like, is there is there a labor demand for AI skills? And can workers then enhance their ability, enhance their positions, right, as workers yeah. by learning some of these skills and utilizing AI, you know, for their advantage uh, to make themselves more productive and to make themselves better off and to make uh, higher income for themselves in the, in the future. And so I think, again, this sort of, oh, it's only going to lead to substitution kind of misses the whole boat because there's this whole other aspect of it, of being able to enhance your own skills and making yourself more productive as well. Wow. Using AI. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Um, you've given us a lot to think about. I know I've been thinking about this for a while and thank you for all the work that you do, Leah, and for being on the Light People Prosper show and God bless you and your family. Thank you so much. It's been it's been great talking with you, Vance. Yes, yeah, same same here. Um, let's keep it going and, and maybe find some work together along the way. And for the audience, thank you for joining us today. Please go out and give us a five star rating, like, and share it with all your friends and family because they're all interested in work and how we can reduce barriers to work along the way. And and there's a lot of other ways for us to have more abundance and a pro worker approach, as Leah so um, eloquently said today. So until next time, let people prosper. 